Hey, what's up everybody? I'm Sam Deiter and today I've got Tim Hobson. Tim Hobson with <laughs> me here and we are substituting in for Amanda who is out in Austin. Um, I forgot what the, uh, the show she's at is Game called. Conference. Austin Game Conference. There we go. Austin Game Conference. So with that out of the way, we're going to skip the intro and we're just going to get right into our talk today, which is Tim and I are going to go through the very basics of using Alembic inside of UE4. So with that, uh, what is basically Alembic? So Alembic is a really, really amazing format. Um, some of you who are from the movie industry or who do visual effects or, I mean, that's the only thing that I know of that it might possibly be used in, maybe archi yeah. architectural visualization, but it's a format that is really, really good. It's storing massive amounts of data that you can actually open up in any other DCC. So say, for example, I am working on something inside of 3D Max and I get my character finished, and I, he has all of his materials and his animations and everything's done, but I want to do the rendering, say, in Maya, or I want to do the rendering in, say, Unreal. Well, if I export him as a, an Alembic file, what it's going to do is it's going to take all of his attributes and everything that's associated, his rig, all of his animations, it's going to package that up very, very nicely for me, and then allow me to easily import that right into any other package without uh, having to jump through a lot of hoops or go through, say, an intermediary converter, you know, maybe converting to one format before I can actually use it in the package that I want to use. Um, this is also a super uh, powerful way to store baked uh, rigid body or um, you know destruction type simulations, and we're going to go over some of that stuff today. Um, storing things like water, I showed Tim yeah. some uh, water stuff you can do, and uh, we are going to cover a little bit of Blender and some 3D Max, um, even though those are the only two uh, outside programs that we're going to be using, and obviously Unreal. Um, you can apply what I'm about to show you to pretty much any package mm -hmm. that'll export uh, your DCC, uh, or export your uh, Alembic files, I'm sorry. So let's go ahead and kick over to our Unreal window here. So we can see that I got a little coffee cup here, and uh, you know I've got this cool little procedural or water looking mesh. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, just going to play this. And if I go ahead and hit T on my keyboard, you can see I've got, this is a cool little water simulation. Looks like, you know, coffee is pouring up through the cup and then very it's a strong cup of coffee. Yeah, you know, <laughs> it's very dark. I was messing around with the coffee shader for a little while to try and get the best coffee look, but I also don't drink coffee. Maybe I should have made yeah. a Mountain Dew. M uh, way more way more research. Very hot chocolatey right now. <laughs> so, okay, we'll say our <laughs> cup of uh, hot chocolate here. Yeah, there we go. But basically, this was made inside of Blender and then exported over to UE4 using the Alembic format. So, what else can we use Alembic for? Well, we can, you can use it for a complex rigid body simulation. So that's going to be like um, uh, what kind of what you use Apex destruction yeah. for, or something yeah, like doing that. Like really complex kind of destruction yep. kind of things. You know. can use it for class simulation. So, mm -hmm. you know, uh, um, if I have a very, very complex uh, uh, dancer who has a, a, a dress that just has all these folds and the fabric's all rippling around mm -hmm. and things like that, um, fluid simulations, obviously, uh, fully built and rigged characters, and you could even bring in a fully built scene if you want. Now, before we get any further, there's one thing that I want to note. Uh, the Olympic file format is mainly aimed when you're going to be making, say, cinematics, or you want to work with multiple packages and then bring all that stuff together inside of Unreal 4 to render. The reason being is that your files, especially your geometry caches, can get pretty big the more complex the simulation happens to be. While it would be possible to say, you know, have this running in say a PC, uh, PC style game, doing a lot of this stuff uh, for say mobile or something like that wouldn't really be an option because it's going to require such a big amount of both memory to actually load it up and run and also storage space to store that information. So keep these styles of effects to things like cinematics that you're going to render out. Um, you could, if you did a little, you know, maneuvering and things like that, use them for some in-game things, but mm -hmm. just make sure you're always constantly checking performance. So I just wanted to make sure I clarified that before we go any further with this stuff. Because it is really cool, but I don't want you to go out and try and then you're like, oh, this runs terribly bad. I was, I was misled. So. Now let's talk about how we actually go about creating some things with Alembic. So basically, 
we can create whatever we want. So let me kick over here to Blender. Now in Blender, what I did is I went ahead and I made this little, this is the coffee fluid sim. And you know, it's just using the standard Blender uh, fluid simulation tools, all right? So when I went to go export this guy, what I did is I grabbed my fluid object. I just came up here, file, export, export Alembic. And then, oh, this is way bigger <laughs> than my monitor uh, upstairs because this little menu right over here is kind of hard to frame. So we uh, see, so we have right here, we have the end frame at 250. And then all I had was all of this selected. I'm not actually going to export this because it could take a little time. It could also crash. I'm not sure. So um, as you can see, some of my files here, I have one for the water, which is 45.9 megabytes. Um, that's fairly large for just one file. And the reason that this one is so big is what is happening with this guy. Um, basically, each one of these frames, what's going on is the Alembic is actually making another mesh for this. And it's making a mesh flipbook. And uh, I'm just going to pull this over on the screen really quick. If you're unfamiliar with what a flipbook is, here's one of my favorite examples. This right here. Uh, from Hot Fuzz is exactly what's actually side. going on inside the of the Olympic the file when you use a geometry yeah. cache. We're going to go over the various caching options, but literally every frame is a new frame of data, just like in this flipbook right here. So, little little comedy to kind of sell the point, but I think that really illustrates what's actually going on. So, now, like I said before, there's three different ways that you can bring data into uh, the Alembic with Alembic. You can use uh, just a static mesh, you can make a skeletal mesh, or you can make a geocache, okay? This right here, this is a geocache, I should say. I should quantify that as a yeah. geometry cache. And this is the, the flipbook method that I'm talking about, which is this right here. Now, we have over here in 3D Max, I have this little teapot, and you can see that this guy's gonna, he's gonna melt down like this. Okay. Now, with this, I can come up here, and again, I can do export, export selected, and I could go to my desktop, and we'll just say A, B, C, and I can select the Olympic format. We'll hit save. This, all we need to do is make sure is that we have the OGWA, Agua. This is the newest file format, so it's going to result in smaller, more compact files for you. Um, and then you just select active time segment, I'm going to go ahead and hit cancel. And what's going to happen is this is basically going to go through and again, it's going to store at each frame the position of these vertices. They're going to, they're going to change. It's going to store that information. Now, when I come over here to UE4, and let me go ahead and we'll go over here to our melt example. And I'll just double click to open this up. And I'm going to come over here and just to simulate so we can see this thing kind of melting down right there. So we see we're getting the exact same behavior that we were inside of 3D Max. So I did that though, and you can see here I've got, oops, now you can see here that I have an actual skeletal mesh here. So I have a skeletal mesh and I have an animation. So in this particular example, instead of using the geometry cache, I've used some pretty fancy morph targets. But I got that information just by selecting a different option when I import it. And let's go ahead and take a look at that really quick. So if I come here to import asset, let's go to my desktop, we'll go to Alembic live stream files, and we will grab my teapot here and we'll press open. Uh, oops, let me just do something really quick. Uh, it says that I already have that one. So we're going to hit control C, control V, and we'll just call it a copy. So now let's import our copy of our copy. And that is not the right one. This is right here. We'll press open. So remember when I said you have three options when you import? Well, right up here in the Olympic type, import type, you can see I have static mesh, geometry cache, and skeletal. So static mesh, really quick. What that's going to do, that is literally going to make a static mesh of whatever frame you have selected down here. So if I said, you know, frame 50, what's going to happen is it's going to go to frame 50. It's going to take whatever information is there, and it's going to convert that into a static mesh for me to place. Now, this is really powerful because this will allow you to do something like, say you wanted to get a, a nice drop of water or something that's really super organic uh, that might be a little hard to model, 
but you still want to be able to, to use it and maybe have some variety within that one Alembic file. So you could say, you know, frame one is version one, frame two is version two, so on and so forth, and then create meshes using this frame start and frame end right here. Um, the other uh, things are, such as the normal calculation, are very similar to how you would calculate normals when you import a static mesh. And then we have our materials here. Again, it's exactly like when you create a static mesh. It's going to create a material for you based on the uh, data that's on the object, or it's going to find one in the content browser that matches it and assign that for you. Finally, here in conversion, depending on where your where your exporting your uh, Olympic file from, you're going to need to change this to either Maya or 3ds Max. I have been doing a lot of experimenting with Blender and noticed that if you do set this to 3ds Max when you're importing a Blender object, you'll get it in the right uh, rotation. So finally, when we're done, so we're going to click Import. But for this guy, what we're going to do is I'm going to hit a geocache for him. Okay, and what this is going to do is we're going to do a sampling type of per frame because we want to make sure that we sample every single frame. I'm actually going to click my start time back to zero because I want to make sure I get the entire melting frame range. And again, I have normal calculations, materials, and conversions, and I'm going to leave this at max because that's where it came from. So I'm going to go ahead and hit import. And this is probably going to take a second to import. There we go. A little bit faster. And then I just dragged it right into the viewport. And if I come over here to my geometry crash, I'm going to go ahead and click running. And I'm going to hit play. And you can see it's melting. Now, the reason this one is melting a little faster is I slowed this guy's play rate down for his animation by 5%. So I just made it you know, melt a little, a little slower. But I can do the same thing to this guy over here by clicking on him and coming right over here to the playback speed and hitting 0.5. Now, when I go ahead and hit uh, simulate, you can see they're doing the exact same thing. They're, they're uh, melting at the exact same rate. Now, while this might not seem very, very cool, uh, the very interesting part about this is that being able to bring something in as either a geometry cache or as a skeletal mesh that's powered by blend, blend shapes gives you a lot of flexibility. Uh, one of the questions that we had was how on the Fortnite trailer did we use Alembic? And they used the Alembic data uh, for all of the heads. So they had a skeletal mesh and animations for the body, but they imported the Alembic stuff as a skeletal mesh like this uh, red teapot right here so that all of the blend shapes and everything that would be needed in order to have these movie quality facial animations match you know, their movie quality body animations they used the Olympic format because it set everything up and it made it super easy to not have to worry about setting everything up inside of Unreal. They just imported and they were able to make tweaks and start recording and basically get, get started working instead of having to set a bunch of stuff up and then start to get to work. So let me uh, look at my notes here real quick. And let me kick over to Max again. So I've showed you this uh, melting teapot. And what this was is just on my modify stack here, I have a teapot, which I didn't even convert into an edit poly. I just put the melt modifier on it. And this is one of the cool things, uh, probably the coolest thing about Alembic is that whatever modifier I happen to put on the stack, and that could be a freeform deform, that could be a, a clothing modifier, um, that could be a, a bend, that could be a twist, basically, Anything that I can put on there that's going to distort my geometry, I can go ahead and I can animate that stuff over time like I've done with this teapot, uh, animated the values here over time. And then I can export that out to Olympic and then bring it into UE4. And the reason that's so powerful is in order to do this type, this melting, uh, I would actually need to figure out a way to build a rig so that I could then attach some of the vertices to the rig and then over time pull each of the control bones down. And that's how you know, high level I would go about doing this and then through you know, trying to figure it out, I'm sure I'd come up with a million other different ways to solve this problem. Because there is no format here, if I come up here with this guy selected and I go you know, export, export selected, none of these formats right here um, one, we're only going to be able to import an uh, FBX and an OBJ, but there's nothing here that will allow us to import a vertex animation like this. And that, again, is where Alembic comes in. It allows us 
to have this great flexibility in how we're actually building our meshes and the things that we're doing inside of our DCC, and then bring that content right over to Unreal and have it work exactly like we wanted we wanted it to. It's really just a less scary way of animating. Yeah, <laughs> At least yeah. that's the way I see it. Yeah, it's a less, I'm not an animator. It's a less as scary as way to animate like you this. Me this and it's like, hey, I can do all this cool stuff and not have to worry about rigging and skinning. Yeah, right. yeah, that's I'm that's in. very true. <laughs> so let me see. I've got uh, another example here. So I've got this destruction example, and uh, I built this on a machine that has one service pack newer, so it'll give a little bit of an error. But this right here, so I made a little box. I used the Veroni fracture uh, script that you can get from Script Spot, and I just ran a fracture on it, and then I ran a Mass Effects simulation on it. Um, so this guy, what we're doing is just, I wanted to do some rigid body simulation. Tim and I were talking this morning. This is one example that I didn't have. Yeah, so let's I, I tend to talk about things blowing up. <laughs> yeah, he, he does <laughs> like the things blowing up. So let's go ahead and check out my destruction. So I'm not gonna save this guy. So let's go ahead and simulate, and there you go. I've got the uh, exact same thing going on that I had inside of 3D Max right here. If I go ahead and hit slash, we'll get the autoplay going, but, and again, the, the thing that actually took me the longest time today wasn't setting anything this up. If you notice here that this has got uh, five materials on it, it's because each one of these faces has its own unique uh, material ID. Trying to figure out how to get all that stuff to go away um, actually is what I spent the most time on. Yeah. Uh, setting up the animation, getting it to play, uh, and exporting it out was about five to 10 minutes worth of work. And as you can see, I wasn't actually successful just yet in trying to figure out how to link all these things together uh, to just one material ID. Um, the other thing I wanna show you guys and gals out there today is this cloth example. So what this guy is doing is it's just taking a plane and it's just gonna drop it over this lovely, lovely little sphere that I made there. I know, super, super awesome hard work. So let's go ahead and open that up right now. So we're gonna go to my, oops, my, not my melt. Just clicking like a crazy man. Yes, we're gonna go ahead and terminate that. So I'm gonna go ahead and hit play. And, uh, oops, I need to actually possess my player because I have this set up so that it will work on the T key. So as I press T, that's gonna cause the simulation uh, to play. And then you can see it's, I'll play it from, a, from right over here. So now, while this looks all cool and you might be getting a million ideas about this, one thing to note is that this cloth right here is basically not going to interact with anything in the scene, okay? It's just basically, think of it kind of as eye candy. If I was to put, um, let me open up my destruction one again really quick, and we're not going to save this guy. So if we were to put, uh, you know, move one of these spheres out of the way, um, oops, I can't do that because it's not set to movable, but let me just move that and press play again. You can see no matter what I do, it's still gonna fall the same because like, this has been pre-authored in another package. So no matter what I try and do to this stuff, these little chunks right here, they're always gonna fall in the same way. And, and again, that's because I pre-authored this in another package and I brought it in. Now, there are some advantages and disadvantages to that. The, one of the advantages is you're always gonna know how this is going to work. So you could use this as an effect um, in your particular game because you always know how the pieces are going to fall. Um, it's like you get a dynamic look without having to actually be dynamic. And it's yeah. Like, and it's, like scary, you know, it's like you get all the material work and, and all the uh, lighting. So it's like all this stuff updates in real time. You don't have to worry about it. And it, it looks like it would. Yep. You know, and it, like, and it looks, and yeah. it gives that conceive, uh, it gives a very, very realistic look. So you mm -hmm. wouldn't give it as you're playing the game and the enemies are coming by you. You just, you wouldn't give it a second thought that, Hey, like, this is pre-rendered. Like one thing I was thinking about too, is like, if you were to do this in 3ds max, my whatever DCC package and export it as a skeletal mesh, you have to have a physics asset to even use like stationary lights for them to shadow correctly because it has to have that physics asset, you know, it's like, mm -hmm. so you have to worry about all that for all these chunks. And it's like, even though they would kind of fall dynamically and roll around, they were still limited to that physics capsule shape. So it's like, they're not going to interact in a, a realistic way. Whereas like this is like, you know, as Sam said, it's like, you can kind of get like a cinematic feel and you can set up for cutscenes and get some really kind of cool interactions that, you know, you can reproduce the same every time on every machine that you, you're running it on without having to worry. Yeah, and there's a uh, there's a plugin for 3D Max, it's called Rayfire, and it gives you just mm. this amazing destruction. Yeah. And you could totally build something in Rayfire, 
bring it right over into to Unreal and then have a one-to-one -one between what you're seeing inside of 3D Studio Max and what's going on inside of Unreal and using all of the you know various bells and whistles that, yes. you, uh, that you have. So it's a great way to, again, to utilize VFX work in something in, that might not be accessible mm -hmm. inside of Unreal. Um, you can use this in conjunction with Houdini to for whatever crazy Houdini-ness that all you happen the, all to, the stuff they yeah, can do all the amazing. procedural stuff <laughs> that you can do um, is available to you now inside of Unreal. Now, mm -hmm. again, remember, it's going to be baked out, so you're right. gonna have to, if you want it to you know, update something or, or have some type of push a body, it's gonna have to do it inside of Houdini, mm -hmm. but you can still render it and you can still update it very, very quickly because again, these files right here, if you'll notice, I can right click on one, and I can go re-import just like I can with any other type of asset that I use inside of UE4. So we've talked a little bit about uh, what Alembic is, and basically it's a very, very efficient way to store massive amounts of data. We've talked a little bit about what it can be used for. It can be used for things like complex rigid body simulations. While this is not super complex, um, I just wanted to give a nice example of it. It can be used for things like fluid simulations. And we're not gonna save that guy like this right here. Whoops, and I'm gonna have to actually possess my player uh, so we can see that actually happen. There we go. We can use it for cloth. So let's go ahead and check out that cloth again really quick. And keep forgetting I gotta possess my player. I changed this stuff a little earlier today. Make it a little easier to recall. And finally, we can also use it to bring in various modifiers from our DCCs of choice that might not necessarily be super easy to either uh, build a rig for or just might not even be possible at all to, to simulate that behavior inside of UE4. Um, but with our Alembic format, it's very easy to do that. Now, I want to come over here and come to my fluid because I want to show you guys a few things. So first I'm going to, uh, asset actions, we are going to, where is, ah, wrong place, show and explore. So if we look at this guy, we can see that he's actually quite, quite big. It's 71 megabytes, okay? If we look at this guy in here, he says he's about 288 KB. Now, as the things become more and more complex, or as you increase the uh, uh, the accuracy of your f your fluid simulation, you, again, these files are going to grow really, 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 really large. So just be wary of that when you're using this particular feature, because you could end up doing a lot of work and trying to import a file that's just it's too big and it's just not going to import. Um, like I, I gave you an example earlier, like when I was talking about it, I was like, you know, you'd show me something at your desk, and, you know, with all this as, as we were prepping. And I was like, oh, cool. It's like, I want to go back and try this out for myself because I haven't messed with, you know, Geometry Crash in a long time, you know, since I worked on the support team. So I was like, okay, you know, let me let me try this out. And I, I don't really use Blender, so I just followed like a five minute tutorial, made water simulation. I made a really big one too, doing like a big old splash. And, and uh, like when I exported it, was, you know, as you said about file size, be careful. It's like I did a really, uh, like complex one as far as like uh, the accuracy of it so it was like 250 frames but it was uh it came out like 400 megabytes yes. you know so so it's like this thing you know it was it was a very interactive kind of like splash and particles kind of things going everywhere but you know it, it can blow up and yeah you get really large you so. can turn on all the bells and whistles, <laughs> all the bells and, whistles. and so and in that case what i would what i would suggest doing is splitting it up so you mm -hmm. could you could do it and i'll show you how to interact with um with the uh, Alembic files, whether it's a static mesh or a geocache or a skeletal mesh through Blueprint in a second, but you could split that up into basically, you know, zero to 10 or mm -hmm. zero to 100 frames or something like that to make the data more manageable so that, you know, you're not running into hitches or you're not running into crashes or well, things like that. Like one thing that. you mentioned like with Fortnite, like when we were talking about it, because uh, there's a VFX article, I don't know if it's linked anywhere on the forums, but it was, uh, it kind of breaks down like what you were talking about mm -hmm. with Fortnite and using the animations. And like using them for these cutscenes, and it's like that was like a specific shot head for like that cutscene. Yeah. And then when yeah. it switches to another one, it's a different head, you know, that is doing that animation. To get yeah. That accurate. So. Because it would be really hard, be really hard, and maybe 
consume way too much memory mm -hmm. to store all of the various uh, facial animations yeah. that are needed for every single shot. Um, it also makes it really easy to just like give it to somebody to go work mm -hmm. on and then you know divide <laughs> divide and conquer, right? So <laughs> we've talked a little bit about um, what you can create with Olympic data. We've talked about exporting Olympic data from both 3D Studio Max and from Blender. We've talked about importing Olympic data. So we talked about how you can import from one Olympic file, make a mm -hmm. static mesh, a geometry cache, or a skeletal mesh. Um, OK, so let's talk a little bit now about using Olympic data. So I'm going to go ahead and actually click over to my coffee cup example again. And we're going to go ahead and we're going to come here to our blueprints. And we are going to open the level blueprint. And I'm just going to full screen this. So here what I'm doing is basically when I press the T key, uh, what we're going to want to do is we're going to want to play this geometry cache from the beginning. What I'm doing right down here is, if you notice, I have the, this thing set here. And I have the start time. So. What this is, is this is actually the geocache. I'll just pull this guy right over into the level. And you can see under geocache, I have running and looping. I can offset the time. I can change the, the tracks and things like that. So since I can do that on the actual asset that's placed within the world, means I can do it inside of Blueprint. And what I'm doing here is I wanted to give us kind of like a, a cool little preview. You know, when you press the three, it just kind of just looks cool. Just some interesting shot for us to, to start the show with. But when I was setting this up, when I went to go play, it wouldn't actually play from the beginning if I, you know, if I set this start time to 0.99 here, and I came in here in my blueprint, and I was setting this to, to zero, like just by going event play and set, it wasn't actually resetting it how I wanted it to. So what I ended up having to do was set, set its time to zero, tell it that it was r running, so it reset itself to actually zero for a split second it plays it resets its time to zero and then it tells itself that it's not playing anymore so then when i come up here and i press the t key it'll actually play from zero instead of from position 99 so when i go like this and i'm actually going to do the right thing this time and i hit t on the keyboard you see it's not going to start from the middle position it's just going to start you know from wherever i could come here and maybe do like 1.5 so when I come here and hit play, you see it's back to the start position. Mm -hmm. So, and just, it was just a little, you know, I was just trying to figure some things out that you can do because it's not very different using an Olympic asset than it is playing a skeletal mesh animation mm -hmm. or something like that. Um, one of the questions that we had was actually about um, motion blur and right now it's not supported, but I was, I was told that there are some changes uh, for the system that include how it interacts with uh, motion blur, um, streaming from disk, and also how it interacts with sequencer. All of that stuff is getting improved. Unfortunately, I don't have a time frame when those improvements are going to come online, but it is something that they are actively working on. I do know that. So let's see here. What else do we have? So if we come here, and what I did is, so this is inside of my level blueprint. If I come here to this guy right here and just select him, which monitor is so much tinier than I'm used to. Uh, if we just pull off this one, we can type in geo, uh, or no, because it's not called geo. It was called, um, uh, hold on. It's not called geocache. It's called geometry cache, I think. Yeah, you had it with geo. Was it, it was, geo? Yeah, it was in there. Cause like yeah, it popped up right. Oh, on. I it see that. Geometry cache. Okay. I it all right. <laughs> so here, what we've got is we've got all of our standard Git and set, and you can see not a lot of this stuff is super complex. You know, there is playing in reverse. It's basically a lot of similar functionality that you would see to sequencer or even um, media framework stuff. Yeah, media framework or, or matinee. Um, we do have some stuff where we can get uh, get material for a collision or collision face index. We can see what type of materials are assigned to this thing. So we do have the ability to kind of go down, kind of see what's hanging out mm -hmm. inside this mesh, what components it might have, or things like that. But other than that, it's not ridiculously hard to use. Just think of it as another way to do animation inside of UE4. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a little bit of a simpler way 
to do animation. Um, I'm going to go ahead and close that because it drives me bonkers flashing up there in the corner. <laughs> so where are we on time? So we're, we're it's about halfway, halfway through our allotted time here. So let's see. So we've talked about, again, and there's not uh, a lot of crazy things that you have to do inside of Unreal to get this to work. Right. It's mainly crazy things that you do outside, you know, say inside of uh, Blender. Ah, speaking of Blender, <laughs> I remember what I wanted to talk about now, scale. Somebody had asked a question about how do I scale things inside of Blender um, to make sure that they match. Because if I was to export this guy right now, he'd be itty bitty 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 tiny like in this example here. So let me go ahead and close this. I'm come over here to scale. We're not going to save you. And let me just put this at one. And we'll put that at one, too. So right here, what this is, is this is the exact same fluid sim. And the other one is, he's, there we go. <laughs> he's very, 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 very little tiny. So <laughs> this is the exact same fluid sim. The only difference is that I've actually set the scale in this Blender scene to be centimeters. And this one over here, I just left it, you know, the default. So it's like, I guess, millimeters or something. Because if I take this guy and I basically scale him by a value of 100, and I think I just put in 1,000, yeah, you will see that uh, although he's in totally a different spot, let's see, where are we at here? One. He said like one. Yeah. yeah. That was in one. So, well. Let me actually do this. Hold on one second here. Set you back to zero and set you back to zero. And we'll go ahead and press play. Um, the only difference between these two, again, is that the one on the left, so this guy over here, the one that's running a little bit slower, it looks like, has been, had its scale just, I opened up Blender, mm -hmm. I added a box, and then I added a fluid domain, and I ran the sim. This other one over here on the right, I actually went into Blender like this, and I came over here, and this is going to take me a second to find because I do believe it's the scene right here. I came here to my unit presets, and I set it to centimeters. And that allowed me to import this guy at, uh, yeah, import this one? Wait. Yeah. Import this one and leave it at a scale of one so that I don't have to actually scale him up. Now, if you forgot to do that and you're like, oh, I, I forgot to do this and it's going to end up screwing everything up if you set your units after you've run your sim, you can come here, export a limbic, and you do have the ability to scale up your limbic data right here. Um, you can also, I do believe, scale some of them I was, I was on about import. To this because this is what I ran into like when I did my little like practice before this. Yeah. It was like, I totally forgot about the scale thing. And in the conversion, I went to yeah, there, there and we I go. set it to custom and then just did 100 for everything. Yep. I, d I didn't try any of the, uh, like, 3DS Max or Maya or whatever. But no, I mean, the custom well, what, what you can do, on. too, is, like, I mean, basically, the, if you look at it here, what it's going to do is you see it's changing the rotation. Oh, it's changing the rotation. So, basically, okay, it's yeah. because Maya Y is up, but 3D mm -hmm. Max Z is up. Well, the reason that I always use 3D Max is because... 3D Max and Unreal are both Z up applications, mm -hmm. so you never have to make this extra step. And in the beginning, I used Maya because that's what they taught in my school, and I always forgot to do the freaking 90 degrees thing, and it yeah. pissed me off so much <laughs> that I just I ditched Maya for Max. And I'm sure there's tons <laughs> of people like you could have written a script. I was young, I was dumb, and you know, I got no shame. I like 3DS Max. Yeah, I'm a Max guy too. <laughs> it's, it's the first thing that I learned. So <laughs> exactly. All right. Although so I will say Blender is like when I did load it up for the first time, it had that option to change like the presets to use 3ds Max like controls. So it, you can use 3ds Max <laughs> controls. For what I did, it worked fine for me. So, but <laughs> the craziest thing about it is when you scrub the timeline with the 3d Max controls, uh -huh. it's not the left mouse button it's as with right, yeah. every other application <laughs> on the planet it's actually the right one that scrubs it and i first i thought i was like i crashed my because i had done gone after simulation and i'm trying to scrub it and i'm like oh it's soft crashed i'm like what do i do <laughs> oh, oh i don't want to oh and uh yeah then i i don't know how i managed to click on it but somehow i figured out that it was the other one so for those of you who have and what he's talking about is if we do file new Reload, oh, 
Let me just actually close this dude. And we'll launch Blender again, because Blender actually launches ridiculously yep. fast. He's talking about right here. So like put it, it up to 3DS like, Max. Like, yay. And now it works similar to how you can move and rotate and pan around inside of 3D Studio Max. So um, let's go ahead and check out some of our Q&A. So, so support for motion blur. So I did talk about, th about this a little bit, but we'll just go over it again right now. Um, so this stuff is in the works. There's actually support uh, coming online sometime in the near future for motion blur, motion blur uh, streaming from disk, and um, sequencer support. So just better support, better integration within sequencer. We also had a couple of questions about the Fortnite trailer. And it said basically in the Fortnite trailer, you know, we heard that you used Alembic. What was it used for? So I met with, uh, or I messaged one of the, the engineers, and he told me that we did, again, we did a hybrid solution for the trailer where we used the Alembic stuff for the complex facial animations and then seamlessly blended that with just the standard skeletal mesh with animations for the body. What this allowed us to do is it allowed us to get these really, really movie quality facial animations and have them seamlessly blend with the other body might not have been the best workflow, um, you know, because you can always improve, but it worked surprisingly well. In fact, it worked so well that, you know, a lot of times that's all that they had to do. They didn't have to go back and figure out another way to solve this problem or just brute force it all with skeletal mesh or something. It might not have been the most optimized, but the results were so good that that didn't really matter because there wasn't a lot of like, oh, well, now I got to go back and fix this one stray vertice that's flying, that, you know, is flying out of the, the uh, flying out into the middle of nowhere because it didn't get skinned or something like that. Yeah, it's like, a, there's the, the, the article, I know I mentioned it a little bit. I'll link it in that forum thread for, for this event for today um, that actually breaks down a lot of the VFX stuff um, covering uh, that. And it actually, that's where I stumbled across it and actually saw that, that Alembic was used. Um, for those, and it kind of gives you a, a comparison shot for a final shot in the trailer versus what it was um, before using that. So. so the other one was the correct scale in Blender. Basically, you just need to make sure that when you're setting up Blender, you set your or your s units to centimeters, mm -hmm. and then build everything accordingly. Um, don't try to convert a scene that's like already after. built <laughs> after. You're that's just, just you're going to have a bad trouble. time. You're going to have a bad time. So. Let's see, let's go ahead and, we got a couple more questions here, so uh, okay. we'll go ahead and go down these. So, does Alembic not result in huge files? It depends on what you do for the Alembic stuff. So, if I come over here to my cloth, and uh, we're going to right click. So, first off, the cloth is 8,192 triangles. So, if I come here and we go to find an explorer, we see that... I always look over there, and, I'm, and I just see the U asset type. I'm like, wait, that's not that big. <laughs> uh, we're looking at about four megabytes. So um, that's not that big. If we look at this map here, we're looking at, what is this, 1.28. So that map does contain you know, all the actors and things like that. Um, is this four megabytes, is this unusable? I mean, it, re it really depends on what you're doing. Again, I would only use the Alembic stuff for um, a, uh, in, uh, a pre rendered cinematic that I'm making with my game characters or something that um, I'm having, like uh, maybe to bring in like a static mesh mm -hmm. of, uh, you know, a fluid that I can use for, you know, a visual effect or something like that. I wouldn't consider using Alembic data in gameplay at this point in time, but. Again, that's, that doesn't mean that you can't. Right. You just need to make sure that you, you think about that so you tell your consumers, hey, by the way, this game requires half a terabyte of hard drive space, mm -hmm. but the explosions <laughs> are amazing. <laughs> yeah, it's just, I, I think the, it kind of scales depending on the complexity of the, the assets that you have yes. and the number of frames that you're capturing for that single asset um, that you're going to import. You know, it's like that's where, frame, or, or where uh, Sam started talking about breaking those up into the section of frames that you want rather than just kind of like this one. Uh, and there's, there's one thing that I, I just totally remembered about this. Um, one of the diff the main difference between being able to use a geocache or a skeletal mesh is going to have to do with how your mesh, basically 
the skeletal mesh, you can only have a set amount of vertices. So on this guy right here, on this, if I, oops, not on my top. I want to hit number seven. Oh, it was already on. Um, you can see that I have a set number amount of, pol of polys there. And as I move this, that doesn't move. Because with blend shapes, no matter what you're using, blend shapes cannot change the amount of vertices. Mm -hmm. Like you cannot have a blend shape that will either add or subtract vertices from your mesh. All the verts have to be the same. They have to be oh, in the same position. That is true. That is, that is one thing I completely forgot about. Like, yeah, like fluid sims, like a really good example of that. So let's yeah. go over here to Blender. And uh, let me go ahead and open up my coffee sim. And it might, uh, it's actually a little bit easier to see. So if we look right up here, we can see how many faces and everything that I have. As I scroll through this, you can see the amount of faces is actually increasing. Mm -hmm. So we can see I started out at 33,000 and I'm going up and I'm at what? 110, 107. Um, then my simulation, I didn't render out that far, but this reason for, for this one, I can only use a geocache because every single frame, my vertices are going to change. Now, this doesn't matter if my vertices go down, that's still a change from the previous frame. So I'm only gonna be able to use a geocache. So I apologize for not mentioning this sooner, but this is the key difference between using uh, a skeletal mesh or a geocache. So yeah. if you try to put this uh, fluid simulation in through the skeletal, skeletal mesh option, I have no idea what's gonna happen. I know it's not gonna work. It, it's gonna have some trouble. Like, like to give an example, it's like uh, another one. Like, cause I was talking to Sam about this, and I was like, oh yeah, you know, I just keep forgetting about these things. But I was talking about like uh, Stargate. Like me and Eric at mm. one point trying to like work on the Stargate like portal. And I was like, I was trying to do all this stuff by you know just like animating the vert vertices and trying to you know use morph targets, and it just it wasn't looking pretty at all. I couldn't you know it's like when you're getting the Stargate portal coming out and that big whoosh, you know, you got all these little particulates that kind of like come out and then it kind of sucks back in. And it's like, you know, at least with geometry cache, you can kind of, you know, take it from that puddle to that big whoosh out and then back down again. And it's changing every single one of those vertices all the time and, and going up and then back down. So and it's like, you just can't get that with skeletal meshes like that. Yep. So let's see what else have we got here. Um, 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 is Alembic limited to just what is essentially a pre-recorded animation that cannot be affected by out? side influences yes. yes unless you now you could do something crafty with i mean you're gonna you're gonna know where something in a frame should happen so you could say if you know it exactly to frame 100 rubble piece 32 is actually going to hit something that's supposed to cause another like a dynamic mm -hmm. type of fracture you could go into blueprints you could figure out which piece that is you could then you know make a copy of that and then spawn that there so that it then Unreal's physics takes over. So you could have this kind of canned animation, this pre-rendered animation, mm -hmm. then you mix it with some dynamic elements, some gameplay style elements. Um, you know, at a very high level, that's obviously something that you're gonna have to build, but that is something that you could, you could possibly do with this particular system. Uh, if you wanted to add some interactivity to it. Now, that could all change in, in updates, I'm not sure. Um, but I do know like skeletal meshes can do mm -hmm. something similar to that um, that might be possible in the future. I just, I don't know at this point in time. So right now, just consider them something that cannot really act on anything else outside of where they were rendered from. So mm -hmm. if it was done inside 3D Max, it's not gonna affect anything inside of UE4. Um, let's hear, someone's asking about the Agua. Like going over the so can you please export? go over the exact format settings like Agua and et cetera that we should use for import into UB4? Other programs have a lot of options. Like did Blender have any? Blender doesn't have yeah, one. I didn't, I didn't notice anyone I was. Um, when I come now. here to Max, if I do File, Export, Export Selected, and we'll just do just random old name here. So basically, this format right here is an older format and it results in a file size that is slightly larger. This right here, this file format right here, the o Otegua, this is a newer file format. It results in slightly smaller file sizes. Um, as for settings inside of other programs, mainly I've just been using the default settings. Mm -hmm. The only thing that I've really changed is I've just changed the file format to Otegua because this is what Unreal is expecting. You'll find this in our official documentation. I can't remember if I've imported the other file format or not, or if I tried mm -hmm. to. Um, 
because this the Otegua, and I hope I'm saying that right, Otegua, Agua, Agua um, is the format that I've just, that's the one that I've been using. Um, as for down here, these things right here, this is just saying, do I want to export a single frame? Do I want to export uh, the entire time segment or just yeah. give me a range? This right here, this every nth frame, basically this is going to take out like, you know, every second frame or every right. third frame or every fifth frame or something like that. This is a way to uh, reduce the overall size of your, um, your limbic cache without sacrificing too much quality. Um, I think we covered this one a little bit, but do these Alimbic uh, animations create uh, LODs? Um, uh, they do don't really kind of create LODs, but it's like the um, geometry is going up and down when you're using geometry cache. Yeah, because it's like, a, like Sam was showing like with the, uh, the vertices counts. Yeah, and when you open it up, you don't have any, you can see, and of course this thing has a ton of materials on it because I, I was just trying to get something to fracture, but there's only really the thumbnail gallery than the geometry cache. So again, this isn't really something that is necessarily made for, mm -hmm. uh, I'm gonna use this in my gameplay, or I'm gonna yeah. use this for some type of effect. It's more like, I'm gonna use this in a cinematic, or yeah. I'm gonna use this in maybe like an interactive cinematic, you know, it's in a, like a, a whoosh effect, or like some, some like if you were fluid gonna use or something. Like in game, it would, I would probably use something really small, something more simple than just a complex. You match. could do maybe something like, like uh, you play like a meta ball animation or something yeah. for stuff the opening and closing. Something very, very targeted, very low poly, but yeah. very something like that something that might be a little hard. Yeah, a might be a little hard to, to generate yeah. um, by hand. How is Limbic implemented into Sequencer? Right now, I believe the best way to actually use Alembic at the moment is to go ahead and, like I've done here from the, uh, oh, of course I'm in the wrong one. Um, oh, that one. Blueprint yeah. Set it play. Yeah. Set it, set it up through a blueprint. There are improvements, a quality of life improvements coming down the pipe for Sequencer. Um, so that is something that is on yeah. that is on the books. So um, keep an eye out for the release. Yeah. And yeah. See just, what we got. I don't, I don't <laughs> have any more than that for you guys, unfortunately. Um, so the destruction demo. How is this not easier to use destructible mesh? Well, I mean, destruct. I mean, I, I think these are like two different things. Like, um, so using a destructible mesh, you're you're relying on physics itself, you know, and, and a different simulation that could potentially happen every time, depending on you know your character and moving through the scene. Um, those are going to work a little bit better for um, like actual in-game stuff. But it's like if you have something that's like a, um, I've been playing through Uncharted for like recently things got like a bunch of destruction going mm -hmm. on and stuff and it's like I'd say you know something like that it's like if you have background stuff kind of like destroying a little bit it's like you know and it's like you can probably do some simple and things there maybe. and again this is just this yeah. is just one like option that you have you're never ever just going to say you know what it's all going to be limbic everything right, exactly. it's just not going to meet your needs you're either not going to have the options that you need to change you're not going to there's just there's going to be something that comes up where you're going to need to use another part mm -hmm. of Unreal. So again, this is just one way. Yeah, this is one <laughs> super flexible way to get really complex animation data inside of UE4 and also play that data in a relatively easy manner. So let's see. Um, doesn't this take up much more memory as every vertex needs to be stored? How does this method perform? Uh, yes, this takes up a lot of memory. Um, this could end up bringing your computer to its knees if you uh, end up, you know, trying to render too much data to the screen at one time. Well, that's true of any mesh or but anything. But again, that's that's yeah. true of anything. Um, like uh, for example, anything. you could do some of the stuff like. Say, say you made an ocean simulation, mm -hmm. right? And it's got Gerstner waves, and it looks amazing, and you just you exported it as you know Olympic. Now that's going to be a lot of data. Well, you could actually recreate that exact same formula and pipe it through the GPU and mm -hmm. give you the exact same results just done on the GPU. Um, it's you still have to pay the cost for all those vertices, but now what you're doing is you're effectively getting that modulation of the mm -hmm. waves for free instead of having to pay for it every frame by reading what's in the Olympic cache. So mm -hmm. again, you could make this really awesome ocean with it, but you could also get that same exact behavior by building something through the material editor. So again, it's when do I want to use this to solve which problem I'm trying to solve? You know, if that ocean, say, was just for a cinematic, then mm -hmm. by all means, render it out in Alembic, 
um, bring it yeah. in, rend uh, render it out in Unreal, or save it. I can't even talk right now. <laughs> I'm so screwed up. Yeah. You know, build it in your DCC of choice, bring it into Unreal so that you can then render out the video that you want of this really complex ocean. Uh, let's see. So we've got no, uh, about eight here, about right? eight more minutes, so we can answer a couple more questions here. Uh, here, do we want to say that cloth one. Maybe? Yeah, uh, we can yeah, do this cloth does, one. Does UE4 engine uh, have the stability to enable cloth or cloth-like things to collide with surfaces? For example, a trench coat that swings and catches a door frame that whips around. Have the trench coat so knows what the. Um, yeah. yeah, you could do that. I don't... Well, I mean, we're kind of talking about two different things there. So if we're talking about the cloth physics system yeah. you know, with our new clothing tool for in-editor editing, it's like you, you can still have cloth interactions with the environment, but you have to set up the physics asset for that um, to have those interactions. Um, for something like this, again, it's just pre-rendered kind of animation that you would want. Um, so I'd, uh, definitely not for like dynamic something on your character Yeah. Um, for a trench coat or anything. So do all light types in UE4 work with these sims? Yes, the thing mm -hmm. that's not going to work with them is sign distance field right. data. Any of that stuff, the yeah, distance these, fields they can't, don't they it, can't update the vertices. Yeah, like it, when it's being distance animated. fields are also based off static geometry. So right. this is non this is not static, it changes every frame. So unfortunately that won't work. Now, uh, to be fair with that, if you say save it as a static mesh, <sighs> will that actually work? Because it's not geometry crash anymore, is it? No, you could save it as a static mesh and then yeah. I guess you could change it like <laughs> oh man! You'd have like an array of static meshes. Well, Purple. if you saved it out, you'd have to like <laughs> you'd have to decimate that one because you only want mm -hmm. the static mesh to have enough detail to encompass mm -hmm. the object. You don't want too many vertices yeah. on it. So I mean, you could you could make like a proxy thing that you go yeah. down through. Yeah, it'd be like a proxy flip book and your regular geocache flip book. That, that, it might work. It might mm -hmm. work. Um, you showed Max Blender, but does it support Maya? Yes, it does. Mm -hmm. Maya is listed on the Olympic page, so if you just go there, you'll see all the options and everything that you need to set up for Maya. Yeah, I'd say just like whatever DCC you're using, because I know there's like what Moto, those, there's those yeah, file names yeah, look really long. As well, so it's just um, I'm not sure which file name you're talking about. Oh, I make really long file names. I probably shouldn't, <laughs> but so do you ever go over Olympic smoke simulation? Um, that is a little bit different. Um, I would solve that in a totally different way using GPU particles. Um, I would actually say, like, Ryan did that stream where he was doing, like, uh, the, the smoke kind of stuff. And he did the GDC talk on it. I know he did a live stream Oh, oh the volumetric. Yeah, um, yeah and that's like, all done. That's all done through pixel shaders. Though. Yeah, yeah. He, he did all that, but then he did render it out as, like, what, a flipbook? Ah, uh, okay. Then, oh, yeah, I remember that one. He rendered it out mm -hmm. to the flipbook texture, yeah. Yeah, um, so it's like, I mean, there's there's other ways to kind of do those kind of things, yeah. I think. And it's like, as Sam kind of mentioned, it's like, you know, this is just one tool to do, you know, some things. But is it the best tool to do that type of effect? Probably not. But, I mean, it's not to say that you couldn't do it. <laughs> All right, let's see. How about that one? Will UE4 eventually have its own fluid simulation effects? Um, <laughs> Maybe. Well, um, I mean, on. didn't we get that like the fluid like thing that Daniel made, like uh, the, uh, the well, fluid interaction? Well, there's the, the targets, right? yeah, there's the blend. Uh, there's blueprints. You can now read and write to mm -hmm. render targets through blueprint, yeah. and that gives you the water interaction. Okay. Uh, what they want, what I think he's talking about, oh, is something, talking about like like this. something like this, like yeah, with all this. something okay. like this. Gotcha. So there is the uh, NVIDIA Flex framework, which is oh, yeah. a. Um, I, I don't know what's been rolled into it, but that contains particle fluids. Mm -hmm. It also contains stuff for hair and like ropes, I do believe. That's all the stuff that was in the uh, the, the VR funhouse. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then they also have the NVIDIA Cataclysm demo, which was a massive water, um, real time fluid. Oh, that's the one with the city where it's yeah, yeah, like yeah, the it's water, flooding. Right? I, yeah. I think it's called Cataclysm. I'm pretty sure, but those are two things that you could look into uh, for some real time fluid effects inside UE4 at the moment. Stock uh, UE4. I mean, and most of those Nvidia things are all available through their GitHub. Yeah, they are. Branch. There are, and there was a lot of people on the forums that have been very graciously recompiling mm -hmm. them and fixing any errors, yeah. you know, through the through the updates. Or if that's the people from Nvidia, and I just <laughs> don't know. Thank you to all those guys because that's really awesome stuff to try out. If you haven't tried that out and you're interested in things like this, 
um, you should give those a try. Yeah, I'll tell you what, when I get back to my desk, I'll, I'll, I'll post that VFX guide that's got like all this breakdown of visual effects stuff and the geometry cache with Fortnite that we did and then, um, and then that as well, a link to that because some really cool stuff. So, well, that's pretty much all that we have for you guys today. If uh, we didn't answer your question or if you ha came up with another question or something, um, just post in the forum, uh, the thread for this uh, particular talk. And uh, I, I check it every once in a while um, just to make sure that everything, all bases got covered and things like mm -hmm. that. So, um, you got anything else? No. Nope. <laughs> all right. Well, <laughs> thanks, everybody, for <laughs> tuning in. And we will see you guys next time. Right, see, see you later. You.